Welcome to another Job on Farms fan page podcast. I'm Matt T. Child, and this time we are looking at the Breeders' Cup meeting, which takes place on Friday and Saturday. From a Job on Farms point of view, we're only looking at Saturday because they only have two runners. We have Tacitus in the Breeders' Cup Classic and Siskin in the Breeders' Cup Turf Mile. And we will be focusing this podcast on both those two races. As you can tell, I still haven't got an intro music uh, lined up or anything. We'll probably have to wait till next season for that now. Uh, it's taken longer than expected, but to be honest with you, it makes no difference. Um, so joining me tonight as we're doing this is Craig Walker, as always, and Kitty Twice, Twice, Trice. Yeah, we'll do that trice. Um, she's here as well um, from the Racing Post Bloodstock Department. Um, she wasn't here on, what day was it now? Sunday when we did the Melbourne Cup preview, but she's here now and I'm glad she is. So we will move straight into it, you two, if you're ready. Um, and we will focus firstly on the Breeders' Cup Turf Mile. Um, Siskin is the Jumpmont runner this year. Jumpmont Farms won this race two years ago now with a horse called Expert Eye, and we will remember that right now. It's I, should, I mentioned him in the last podcast when we did the Melbourne Cup one because James McDonald rode him at Royal Ascot and he was looked after by a good friend of mine called Joanna Wattish. I'm hoping I've said that right. And she listened to the last podcast and um, she messaged me with um, an audio at, uh, as to how to say her surname because I refused to do it last time. So hopefully I've got that right for her. Um, we'll see. I'm sure she'll message me when this goes out. But we'll, as I said, we'll start with Siskin, and I'll come to you first, Kitty. Um, has your opinion changed of Siskin since he won the Irish 2000 Guineas? Well, I think his last race. I thought that it was. I thought it was a race where Persian King got away with them. He dictated from the front, and I don't know. I, I'd be prepared to give him another chance off the back of that because I don't think it was his true running and for the Sussex I I, I don't want to say he sort of didn't want it but I I don't know I mean it was a good run he came third behind you know beating some very good horses and it may just be I think I think this track and I think this track will suit him a lot better than perhaps somewhere like Goodwood so um, I'm really looking forward to seeing him Ray, what do you make of him? Well, I, I just think, uh, as Kitty said, like uh, I think you could maybe put a little bit of a line through the Prix de Moulin last time because it was a little bit of a muddling race. Um, we uh, we talked about it in one of our previous uh, podcasts where um, Persian King and Circus Maximus kind of shot off in front and it was all a bit of a strange run race. So I think... Based on that, I would maybe give him another chance um, to show his true colours um, over in America. Um, I don't think there was anything particularly wrong with his Sussex Stakes run. Yes, he lost his unbeaten record, um, but it was up against some really top-class milers in Mohartha, mm -hmm. Circus Maximus, Kamiko, Wichita, just to name a few. So I think given if we see the real Siskin performance similar to that, I think he's got a chance of getting involved over there. Does it worry you that his, his classic form hasn't really worked out? In some ways, yes, because when you look at like some of the horses he was up against, some of those haven't really went on, some of the ones further back in the field. Then again, you've got had the Armoury who ran a really good race in the Cox Plate, um, so, and also the Irish Champion Stakes as well. So some of it has worked out in some ways, but some of it hasn't. So I don't know. I, I just think that... In terms of an Irish um, classic, as in the 2000 Guineas in this case, I just don't know if some of those horses really were the top draw horses that you might have associated in years gone. Um, we've had Vatican City, who put in a bit of a strange performance in the Sussex Stakes, was well beaten that day. Um, I don't know if something went wrong. I, I may have finished lame in that case. Um, Look, 
Y Fernandez. I don't really know how you say that because I'm not a Spanish person, but apologies for that. Um, he hasn't really progressed in the sprinting ranks, so he's going to be an interesting quantity in this race too, obviously stepping back up to a mile. So I, I don't know. I just think that it could have worked out a little bit better overall. But there are some pieces of form that give him some hope. And Kitty, when we're talking about Siskin, the first thing that comes to mind is turn a foot on fast ground. Mm. And he'll get that yeah, exactly. opinion, surely. Definitely. I mean, have, uh, he's drawn in still four, so, you know, that's a decent draw. A lot of these American races are quite sort of rough and ready. I mean, perhaps more so on, on the dirt, but... Um, He's, he's proven himself, you know, in a bigger field, like he showed in the Irish 2000 guineas. He's very sort of neat and nimble, so I wouldn't be worried on that score. Um, and I think I think he'll like, you know, he definitely will like the strong pace that they tend to set. So I think he's got a lot in his favour here. Um, I think the important thing about Siskin is that I've always thought of him as a seven furlong horse. I think he gets a mile, but I think seven furlongs is ideal for him. And I think round a two-turn mile on fast ground, I do think this is a tailor-made. I, I, I was hoping after he won his classic that they would target him at this race. I just thought it was tailor-made for him. But it's an interesting point that you just made there, Kitty, about the field size. He's only ever run in a field with more than 10 runners, double figures, once. And that was in that Irish 2000 guineas. The rest of the time, it has been five runners, six runners, seven runners. So does, yeah. that, does it concern you at all that he's now, as you say, there'll be no heart, there'll be, you know, no corner given over there and he's drawn low. Um, you know, he might have to fight his corner, so to speak, early on to get... I don't, a, think, it, yeah. I don't think it worries me too much. I mean, he's got Colin Keane on him. who knows him extremely well and he'll know where he wants to position him I'm sure they'll have come up with a good plan I mean there's so, you know there's quite a few horses in there who actually could make the pace I mean you've got the likes of um you know Circus Maximus likes a strong pace so does Safe Voyage um and I think you know as you say around that two turn I think it could set it up, set it up quite nicely for a horse who finishes like he does who has that turn of foot there are other horses in here who who do like to make the running. Factor this is one. Halliday is another. Where do you, Craig? Where do you see Siskin being positioned after a furlong or two? I think Colin will probably try to make him break fairly well. I don't think he'll go pushing up with the pace. I think he'll let them get on with that. That's perfectly fine. I think what he'll probably do is he'll probably sit somewhere in the middle. I'm thinking maybe around about sixth, seventh position, just off the pace, not like too far back, just somewhere along in the middle somewhere. Um, we're going to probably see a fast pace from the likes of fact that this holiday, because they like to push and get up and make all. Um and I, I just think he'd be perfectly positioned on the inside to come sort of two, three, four wide um, when it comes to the crunch. However, the fast pace of, and fast nature of that race should really play to his strengths. The way you two are talking, I can see an expert eye scenario here where they, they go quick up front, Siskin swings wide, takes his time as, as, as he can do, but then accelerates past them inside the final furlong. Can, can we draw parallels between him and Expert Eye here? Or... Uh, I think, like, in terms of their running styles and the way this race could set up, I can certainly see it. They, they both have that uh, same edge. I would say, like, for me, when you mentioned earlier about Siskin being a seven furlong horse, I was always a little bit sceptical that Siskin might not really get a mile. Like, the mile is probably the stretch of his limits and um, however the way he sort of coasted up in the the 2000 guineas like gives me full confidence that he can definitely get a mile there's no problem about that and i think that that quick pace that we're expecting to see it could be exactly like an expert eye finish i, I think that they're, they're going to go very hard in front and it's going to mm. suit somebody who's coming late on from a bloodstock point of view, Kitty, um, that's your game these days. It is disappointing, isn't it, that he, he will be retired after this. This is it. For yeah. 
So it's so yeah. few races after all. It is. It is a shame. Um, I'd have loved to seen him at four, like you know, you know, like Pinatubo and whatnot. But it's the name of the game, unfortunately. But um, I like. I really do like the fact that um, that Joe Lyons has sort of. Although I think he wanted to take Sisk into, you know, the Breeders' Cup next year, I, the fact he had this in mind, you know, I think that's a good sign. He knows the horse so well and he wouldn't be taking him thousands of miles across the Atlantic, you know, just for the beer and whatnot. So um, I think I think there are some positives to be gained, even if it is quite sad he won't run again after this. Can you tell us what sort of beer Jair Lyons likes? I that, wouldn't know. Is that an in-house but, secret, uh, that one, at the Racing Post? No, I, I don't know, I'm afraid. Um, uh, shame, but um, I'll try and find out. I yeah. don't know if I'll be um, successful anyway, but um, Fantastic. yeah. Uh, well, that's the most important thing anyway. Um, but yeah, he's going to Japan, isn't he? And I just hope he does well out there. I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed watching this cult run. I'm, I must be honest, from, from day one. Um, and there's another person who's going to be really excited to see him. Caitlin Yellick, another close friend of mine, if I can get away with calling her that. She um, helped develop him when he before he went before he came to Europe when he was uh, at Jump on Farms in America so she'll be very nervous and anxious when he lines up on Saturday um, but, but from a winning point of view I, I do think he's got an excellent chance if if the ground does remain fast and he gets that luck in running it all goes smoothly I I still feel as though we've not seen the best of him yet which is quite strange given his profile. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think, uh, as we've mentioned as well, um, him retiring at three is a little bit disappointing um, when you you really feel like there's more to come from him. I definitely think he would have got better at four. Yes, right. That's Siskin. I think we can all agree that he's got an excellent chance if everything does fall his way. Of those opponents, of his rivals, will remain in Europe for the time being. Cameco won the English equivalent of the 2000 guineas. Um, Connections then experimented a bit with him. He went for the derby, um, didn't quite get home. He dropped back to a mile in the Sussex when he was just behind Siskin, didn't get lucky running that day. Then they took on Gay F in the Jump on International. Again, probably didn't quite get home, but he was seen at his best in the Joel Stakes at Newmarket um, when he was carrying a penalty against some really good horses. Ben Battle, I think, was one of them. Um, like Siskin, this is, I, I believe, Kitty, this is his swan song as well. He retires after this, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, it's a bit, it's sort of similar to um, the owner's roaring lion, obviously not on the dirt but um he he's another one who i think will go well because he he's he's sort of the opposite of siskin i think he's a he's sort of a straw a, he stays a mile very very well perhaps doesn't quite see out 10 furlongs but he se definitely sees out a mile really well so um be interesting to see how he goes he's he's not too far drawn from siskin so be interesting to see what the tactics are there yeah, it's interesting you said, because I was thinking of him, and I'll come to you now, Craig, I was thinking of him uh, earlier, and uh, both his wins this year have come at, come at Newmarket on a, at, on a stiff mile, um, and obviously he was a staying two-year-old last year, he won the Racing Post Trophy. Are, how, how concerned are you around a two-bend mile like this, that Kamiko just won't have the finishing kick, say, of a Siskin? I think it's it's an interesting scenario with Kamiko because obviously the best runs that we've seen from him have been over Newmarket pretty much on a straight mile um, so the the incorporation of the turns might not be as suitable for him as it might be for something like Siskin um, he was a good winner last time in the dual stakes, he's obviously got a great record at Newmarket on that stiff track um, he didn't quite see out those staying trips so coming back to a mile is a sensible move again Um I just think that he's got a real big chance, but my possible worry with Kamiko is 
is he going to get potentially trapped on the inside? He's drawn in store two. But then also, is he really going to handle those turns as well as some others? And I'm not so sure based on some of the form that he's produced as well. Even when he won um, the um, Brace and Post trophy or the Burton Futurity trophy, as it's now known, um, that was, again, a straight mile at Newcastle. So my concern would be the turns. An interesting point. I mean, you, you mentioned, I think you both mentioned the draw there. He's one that I think would have preferred to have been a bit wider because there is going to be a lot of pace. And as you say, trapped over on the inside, it's, um, I don't think that's the ideal position for him because I, I just can't see him lying handy. Not for too long anyway. I think he'll, he'll probably want to, but I'm, I'm just not sure he'll have the gears to be able to hold a position early on. That would be yeah. my worry with him. Yeah, I would agree with you there because I think there's going to be, as I said, a lot of people pushing up on the pace here. Um, so getting stuck on the inside might not be ideal. Aidan O'Brien has won most, but he's never won this uh, race. I'm not sure. What, what is his record like at the Breeders' Cup? I'd imagine it's quite good. Um, not too his bad. record in America is actually not that great. Um not I'm I'm talking about in general. Um, yeah. There's there was a statistic I saw that I think it was his last 58 runners he hasn't won in America or something. It was something mm. like that. I could be totally wrong, but um, yeah, his record is not as you know spotless as we've come to expect from from Bal you know Aidan O'Brien. So um, but he's got he's got a good chance here. I think you know so I could be proven totally wrong. Well, go on then, that, and that good chance lies with. Circus Maximus. I mean, he. The good thing about him is, you know, one of the upsides of him is he's usually so so consistent. He, I don't know what happened in the um, QE two last time. I mean, I don't. I'm. I know Aiden said about the ground, but he's. I think he's won on pretty testing ground before. So, um, my he's worry with. Yeah. Yeah, my worry with him is just whether you know, whether a long season has caught up with him, but I just, you know, never never doubt Aiden, I guess. So we'll see. Another thing about Circus Maximus is he, I mean, I've always described him as a nine furlong horse. I, I, he's, he's not a genuine miler for me, and he probably doesn't last over 10. I, I think nine is ideal for him. Um, but he does like to go forward, and from stall one, he, he's going to have to, he's going to have to break fast, and take advantage of that draw, isn't he, Craig? Because otherwise, he'll find himself in a position where he doesn't really want to be in. Yeah, yeah. definitely. I, I think the <clears throat> excuse me. I think the draw um, in this case is going to really dictate the tactics for Circus Maximus here. Um, whereas we've seen in the past, he can go forward, he can sit in behind, he can sit mid-pack. He's, he's done all of that sort of thing. Recently, he's been tending to favour being on the pace end and definitely being drawn in stall one. He's going to want to get out quick. Um, this is one of those sort of pace angles that I was kind of getting at earlier. I can see him wanting to break very quickly and try to get up there because there's going to be a lot of uh, other ones, as we mentioned, like Factor This and Halliday, who are going to want to be up there and getting on the front end. And I think he's going to want a piece of that. It will be interesting to see who is in front after the first couple of furlongs and who is dictating it. It wouldn't surprise me if it was Circus Maximus, but he, as I said, he'll have to break from that draw and he'll have to take advantage of that. Um, one that we've seen, one that is still in training, a six-year-old mare, one master. I mean, what a career she's had. Um, she's, just a, she's just been fantastic for her connections. Um, how concerned are you about the ground for her, Kitty? Is, isn't she usually a filly who likes to get a toe in? She does. I think she won at Goodwood on slightly quicker going than ideal. And I think Connection said she was sort of feeling it a bit. So it's not just the ground, but also the trip. I don't think, you know, she's probably more of a seven furlong mare and that would concern me as well. But I can see why they want to give it a go. I mean, she's got nothing else. She's got nothing to lose. And I think this is her final start. So why not give it a shot? You know, I, was just gonna ask, I was just going to ask you about that. Is, is this her swan song as well? Is this another one? Yeah, I, I think so. Judging from what I've seen on Twitter, it looks like it. So um, I guess, you know, why not? Why not have one last crack at the dice and see, you know, you 
don't gain anything by not running. So um, it'll be interesting. Yeah. But I, I have my reservations, I think. Her owners, her owners are American after all. Um, I can't help but always come back to Barbaro or Barbaro, I should say. Um, yeah, what a tragic story that turned out to be. Craig, um, do you like one master? Uh, I mean, she's a great mare, obviously, uh, three time Prix de la Forêt winner. Uh, you know, and you, you don't get much better than that um, on the grand stage. But agreeing with Kitty, uh, the softer the better for her, really. Uh, she's going to probably want a bit more cut in the ground. So if it turns up like quite firm or good, it's probably not going to really suit her perfectly. Although, obviously, there is little instances of her running well on it in the past. Um, but seven furlongs is definitely more her trip, and I, I think a mile's probably a bit of a stretch. Um, but I mean, she's a she's a grand old horse. The pace could collapse up front and maybe set it up for some, like her possibly picking up some of the pieces later on. But I just can't envision that winning the TR against some real hardy top class milers. Yeah, uh, she's going to have her work cut out a little bit, I think. Another one who I think has got their work cut out, and again, same with you, Craig. Uh, safe Voyage, just don't think he's good enough to be perfectly honest with you. Yeah, it's, it's the same sort of feeling as one master here. Um, similar sort of profile in terms of the distances that Safe mm. Voyage runs at, seven furlongs, prefers yes. probably... The ground will probably be on the OK side, but doesn't mind a little bit of soft ground, so versatile ground-wise. Again, my concern would be the mile. Although, saying that, um, he did win a fair tussle in the Boomerang Mile um, over at Leopardstown uh, earlier in the season. So, he's gritty, but again, I just think he's just just a little bit short of the top-class miler that you're looking for to win this. Back to the Phillies, um, or mares, I should say. Uni, who was victorious in this... 12 months ago, Kitty. She comes into this off the back of her second First Lady stakes at Kingland. Um, what are her chances of um, back-to-back wins in this race? A Goldie Cova, doing a Goldie Cova. I mean, I can, I can see it. I think she'll love the pace. She's very, you know, she finishes with a right flourish. Um, I just, yeah, no, I, I do like her, actually. I haven't looked up her profile as much but just I rewatched her run last year and you know she quickened up well and put some you know, good horses to bed so I think she's got every chance really um, an, intri- an intriguing one uh, coming from Brazil Ivar or he's Brazilian bred by Agnes Gold um, who was Japanese bred uh, the mayor by Smart Strike Canadian bred so um, it's all there internationally for this one. He won a couple of group ones in his native Brazil, and he's come up to America. Um, he's won twice, including at Keeneland last time when he beat Raging Ball in the Shadwell Turf Mile. What chances do you give him, Craig? Is he one on your radar? He's one that's definitely improving. Um, obviously, as we touched there, he's a Brazilian group. One winner, obviously won the Shadwell Turf Mile as well. Um, you know, beating some milers who've you know been round the block a bit in America as well, uh, and that was quite an impressive win uh, for uh, this Brazilian bred. Um, but again, this is another step up again, I think. And I think like some of these um, milers in this race are really tough, hardened milers, um, but improving all the time like improving cult I think he's, there's still some improvement that might be there and he could, he could be the surprise package yeah I said that you beat Raging Bull um, last time out I won't do my Robert De Niro impression here um, <laughs> but he beat here. I, I actually think um, Raging Bull could uh, reverse the form there I'm not um, I'm not convinced by either to be honest I mean he, he previously to his win in that great one he was beaten by Flavius uh, Judgment Horse um, in a listed race, and um, I wouldn't be giving Fl- um, Flavius much chance in this, or Flavius, however you want to say um, his name. Another one we should mention: Todd Pletcher has Halliday here, as I think I think he'll be the one that will be in front um, early on. He he's improving, and he was last seen winning the four-star Dave Handicap, which has now been upgraded to Grade One. 
I remember Seek again won that a number of years ago for Jobmont, um, but it was only a grade two then, unfortunately. Um, chances for him, Kitty? I like the fact he's coming in, you know, probably near, near enough off a of career best. He's likely raced. I think there was a stat about war fronts at Keeneland. I could be wrong, but, um, you know, he'll like the firm ground. You can't really rule out any of these or a lot of these American horses on home soil. So I'd be interested to see how he goes from the front, especially as it's quite sort of, you know, it's it's a nice mile and it's, you know, he should finish with a rattle. It's just whether anyone can obviously catch him. Yeah, another one who's going to be up there, I think, is um, fact to this for Brad Cox, who's had a splendid season, it has to be said. Um, he's a prolific winner, at grade two level and grade three, I'm just not sure he's up to this level. In saying that, he wasn't beaten very far by digital age in the old Forester Bourbon Turf Classic Stakes at Churchill in September. That was over nine furlongs. Um, and to be honest, I don't really fancy digital age much, so I can't say too much for fact to this. Um, but I, I suppose you, you, you just never know if they go hard enough. Um, right, we'll come down to the crunch. Who who are we fancying to win the Breeders' Cup Turf Mile? I'll come to you first, Kitty. Oh gosh, um, I would. I I do love Raging Bull just as a physical specimen. It's hard. I would probably go with him and have Siskin each way with maybe a little bit on. Oh, gosh, it's I, I could pick them all. I do love Safe Voyage, but I'm going to keep Sentiment out of it. So, Raging Bull and then Sisk in each way for me. All right, Craig. Yeah, well, I'm definitely in the each way Sisk and uh, Ballpark as well. I, I definitely think he ticks a lot of boxes, and I think he's definitely going to get himself involved um, if the, the angle of the race actually develops in the way that we've said. Um, I quite like Halliday. To be quite honest, I think he's a, a very hardy four-year-old colt. The four-star day of handicap win was quite impressive. He kept galloping all the way to the line, um, even when he's went up with the pace and been hard on the front. Um, he's, if he gets out quick and he's allowed to dictate, which could be a little bit difficult, depending on if the likes of Circus Maximus Factor, this, the types we've mentioned, get out quick too. Um, but if he can get out quick and get across, and get that um, up with the pace, maybe even get to the rail if possible. Um, he's going to be hard to pass, so he's he's one to watch for me. And I'm just going to sit on the fence and just hope that Siskin um, comes out on top and gives Jair Lyons a Breeders' Cup winner as well as Job on. I, I just think this is a fantastic race. I must admit, it's um, Kitty was saying there. You know, you, you could throw in the majority of these and. Um, you know, it's it's a, it's a very tight race. I, I do think tactics will dictate who comes out on top. Um, I think they're all important in this. Um, but moving on, probably to the race of the meeting, which, given it's the finale, it probably should be, the Breeders' Cup Classic. Um, we have 10 runners this year. Um, Jobmont are represented. They won it a number of years ago now with Arrogate. I should have had a... VT of him, shouldn't I? Or an audio set up, but I completely forgot. Um, but Tacitus, another grey. Um, who wants to start with Tacitus? <laughs> that says it all, doesn't it? Yeah. Kitty. Where do where do you where do you stand overall with it, Matt? Where do I stand? Um, I think he's a very good horse. I, I do think he's a very good horse, but I, I think he's. He's just shy of a, of a grade one. I mean, that's not um, that's not an outra that's not outrageous thinking or anything, given that how many times he's finished second at this sort of level. He's he's had two easier opportunities than this recently, and he's blown them both. Um, he tried to make the running last time out, didn't he, at Belmont? There was no gallop, and he, and he didn't really have much choice but to go forward. And I think one thing that he will appreciate here is that he won't have to be on the front. There will be pace for him to run at. Um, and I just think if Jose Ortiz can hold on to him long enough, 
I, I, I don't think he's got much of a finishing kit. I, I think he's got one run and that's it. He's not a horse that will quicken tr tr twice, twice. Oh, God's sake. Um, so I think if you can hold on to him for as long as he can, you know, I, th I think that's the best way to play it. But even so, I, I, I just don't think he's good enough. Sadly, I, I just think he'll find a number too good. Yeah. Sounds like Fair you enough. Agree. Sounds like you both agree on that. Well, I think, as we've mentioned possibly a little bit in previous podcasts and when we've just been generally talking, um, he's obviously yet to win a Group 1 level. Um, he had a great opportunity last time, you feel, and almost like penalty kick moment and it, it didn't quite work out but then again he was made to kind of make the run in and he was possibly you know there to be shot at by the ones who just sat in behind him um, he's only had one win and six starts at a mile two as well so that tempers a little bit of enthusiasm for winning a race like this um, however his win was a comprehensive win in the Suburban Stakes beating the likes of Moretti and Parson Reed, there's some decent horses in there. So Winston, well beaten as well, who's had a few uh, runs up against before. Um, it's third in the Jockey, Goal, Goal, uh, Jockey Club of Gold Cup last time, obviously, as we've just said there. He only got beat a couple of lengths. You know, he, he runs well at Group 1 level. He's, he just always feel that he's just never going to get that breakthrough, um, which is a shame because he's a talented animal. There's no doubt about it. But I just feel he just comes up short at this level. He's definitely grade three, grade two quality. But that elusive group one, he had a real good opportunity, I feel, last time. I think that does pretty much sum him up. Um, I mean, it'd be great for his down close hatches if he could win a grade one. But um, who knows? Look, he's only four. I'm, I'm, sure he'll set up. I'm sure he won't be retiring. Certainly not to jump on at the end of the season. So he'll probably st stick around next year. And he will be able to pick up a weak group, uh, grade one somewhere. Um, and I hope he does. I just don't see it being here. Um, Kitty, we could we could start with any of these. Um, it's that good a race. But which horse do you want to start with? Oh, we could, yeah, you know, start with the Bob Baff Baffert trio. Um, less said about Mr. Baffert, the better, I think. He's in a bit of trouble. But, um, <laughs> yeah, though... Um, you know, he, he, what can you say about his three? I mean, I do like Maximum Security a lot. He was beaten quite comprehensively last time by Improbable, but I just, I, I love that horse. And I remember watching him in the Saudi, oh, was it the Saudi Cup? Yeah, the Saudi Cup. And um, that's right, yeah. I just love the way he travelled, you know, travelled through and just, you know, got it done. So I think I'm probably going to stick with maximum security, but um, you can easily make an argument for authentic and improbable too. And yeah. Out of interest, do you think this is maximum security's best trip, 10 furlongs? Or do you think he might be better suited to slightly shorter? I mean, he has won more races over shorter. Um, I don't think it will be... A massive issue. I mean, it just depends on how they run this race. I mean, it's usually run at a good clip, so you wouldn't want him to get too involved too soon. But um, I just, I, it'd be interesting to see how he's ridden, put it that way. Um, I think it's his last race as well, or one, you know, potentially his last race. So they obviously want him to go well and hopefully go out with a win, but it's it's a very, very good race. Uh, Craig, coming to you, improbable. <laughs> I mean, he's he really he's really taken off this year, hasn't he? Or certainly in the last few months, he's won three on the bounce, uh, all at Grade One level, and he recently beat um, Maximum Security, as Kitty said, in the Awesome Again Stakes at Santa Anita. If you had to pick between the two, who are you siding with? <laughs> um, because they are, they are uh, quite closely matched, aren't they? Yeah, they are. They're very closely matched. Um, I mean, the, the, this whole race is like one massive headache because I mean, I, I've probably been involved in a betting financial way with virtually all of these horses. So, um, head over heart, it's going to be hard to pick like who stands out the most. But 
looking at the Baffert trio, um, we'll start with Improbable and Maximum Security. Um, they're very, very closely matched, as we've said. Um, Improbable's had a, a great season. Um, worthy, like, being like up there with the favourites um, based on his last three outings. Um, winning in the awesome again, the Whitney, the Hollywood Gold Cup. Um, and also having some of these uh, contenders in this race behind him as well. So, he, he, you know, the form lines all point to a big run from him. Um, and this this sort of trip, the mile two, is probably a little more suitable for him. It's not that um, Maximum Security doesn't like the one mile two. I just feel he might be a little bit better over nine, possibly rather than ten. Um, and my concern for Maximum Security is he often likes to dictate the pace um, so with him being on the wide draw I'm not sure if he'll be able to get that depending on obviously how everything breaks but he's the widest draw here so I'd be a little bit concerned about him getting across um, but take nothing away from maximum security he's a, a top class animal as well his win in the Saudi Cup was redemption in my eyes for his disqualification in the Kentucky Derby mm. um, so you know he, he's, a, he's a top class Horse, yeah, and you know it, it's really difficult to choose between the two. See what one thing that is nice here is that we've got the first and second from this year's Kentucky Derby um, taking part. We've got Authentic um, who won the Kentucky Derby, beating Tis the Law. Um, Authentic's been beaten since then in the Preakness, um, whereas Tis the Law's had a two-month break following quite a busy time of it early on. Um, they're closely matched again. And um, who do you see coming out on top this time, Kitty? Um, it's a tricky one. I would, I do like Tis the Law a lot, actually. Um, he's got, he's, he's got, I think he's got quite a nice family anyway. And I like the fact he's coming off a bit of a break. He has been quite busy um, earlier on in the season. But I think he could go well. I I do. I'd probably sit, stick with him. But again, it's quite a close call, isn't it? Right. it again, we've got another scenario here where um, it's it's quite tight in terms of like these two contenders because they're very closely matched on all lines of form. Um, Tis the Law will probably benefit for the break. Um, obviously, he's been kept back with this in mind and he didn't do a lot wrong behind Authentic um, in the Kentucky Derby. Um, it was a, a still a, a good run. Um, but I can't help but have been impressed with Authentic having to get uh, into that lead from such a wide draw. And there was a lot of doubt as um, after his run in the previous race, um, where he only just he was all out pulled out all the stops to win by like a nose um, in the Grade One prior to that, um, and they were a bit worried about his wide draw. But he could not have won any better. And when push came to shove, and he was really uh, asked to give, he, he found more, and he just kept going and going. And Tis the Law had no answers that day. Um, Authentic as well um, with his. Um, I'll just pull up that line there. His second behind um, Swiss Skydiver in the Preakness as well. I watched that race and Authentic was unlucky not to win that day. And to be quite honest, given that level of form, that was a real tussle all the way to the line. Authentic only went down by a neck, and yet they were nine and three quarter lengths ahead of the rest. So Authentic having not had Squiz Skydiver in that race, could have won that by any amount of distance, if not, you know, involved in that duel with Swiss Skydiver. So you could have even been looking at Authentic as being favourite for this race, had it have, you know, pummeled its opponents in that sense. So I, I just think there's a, a lot of contending form here. And again, it's very tight, but I, I think Authentic might just have the edge. Mm. Interesting. Albert Stahl won this with uh, Blame in two, 10 years ago now, beating Zenyatta. I'm sure we'll all, we all remember that race in particular. He has Tom's Detar this year, um, who's a seven-year-old by Smart Strike, who is another grade one winner. He won the uh, Clark Stakes um, this time last year at Churchill Downs. What chance should you give him, Craig? I mean, he's not he's not run for three months. It's quite an unusual preparation for an American horse. 
Yeah, so it's a bit of a an interesting one, um, but I have a lot of time for Tom's data. I think he's a, a really nice horse. Um, he won the Stephen Foster uh, in great style. He's been in the form of his life. He's seven years old. He's absolutely flying this season. His third behind him probable um, isn't actually um, that bad of a performance, but I, I feel like I would have liked to have seen him just get a little bit closer to him um, last time. But... Like I said, you can't knock a horse that's in great form. Um, he comes into this off the back of that little break, which is, as we said, a little unusual. Um, but maybe it might freshen him up a little bit. Um, this is a really tough race, so you know he's probably going to need everything for it. However, I did notice one slight negative for Tom's data in terms of this race is that no seven-year-old has actually mm. won this race. Mm. So maybe the age factor might be against him. Um, Kitty, one more to mention. Um, Global Campaign, who hasn't run for two months, having beaten Tacitus in the Woodward Handicap at Saratoga. How much chance are we giving him, considering we haven't given much time to Tacitus? You'd probably say he needs to step up. uh, Sorry, step up on what he's done. It's just interesting, because I remember watching this race a couple of years ago, Roaring Lion. This is on a different tangent but it, it's it's so different to the turf I mean maybe it's just an American way of riding but they just go hell for leather straight away and it's just a completely different way of racing I think and you need horses who are brave and can cope with you know all the dirt flying in their faces that's just a general observation so um do you know what I mean? I wouldn't say I've got a you know a particular opinion on global campaign, but if I did, it you know based on his form with Tacitus, he'd need to step up a bit more. Yeah, um, I think we've we've spoken about the main contenders here, and I, I do think it's really close. Um, as, as Kitty said, the Baffert trio, um, throwing Tis the Law, Tom's Data, it's. It, it's a cracking race, this, and um, I think we're all going to have trouble n- nailing our colours to one mast. Um, I'll start with you this time, Craig. Um, well, I mean, we picked you picked three in the previous race, so I suppose you can pick three here. Um, go ahead. Well, <laughs> I know, I know whichever way that I go here is probably going to be wrong because this is a top, a top race. Um, like I said, I think it's a much stronger renewal than last year. I think like the the contenders that you've got, the Kentucky Derby runners, the the lines of form that all of these horses have battled each other one way or another throughout the course of this season. So it's going to be very, very interesting. I think that my gut feeling is that authentic trying to run a real big race. He's had a busy season, um, but I think he just keeps on giving um, the trainer, the owners, love this horse, you know, they get so much um, out of him um, and he just keeps finding more and I just think that given his absolutely epic duel with Swiss Skydiver last time, he would have routed the field um, and I still feel that there's more to give. Um, and I think he's not going to be faced by the wide draw either because we saw that in uh, the Kentucky Derby. He obviously got across from that wide draw. Um, and I just don't know if there's going to be that much up on the front end here. I know maximum security might go forward with him, but I'm not too sure about some of the inside because I feel like they might just sit back a little more. Mm. Um, so for me, authentic would probably be the the main pick here. Um I've got a lot of time for Tom's data, and I think he might run well at the price. You see? My heart says maximum security, but I think, you know, uh, I do like to the law as well. It's going to be hard from the draw, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. You'd have to be sort of slightly concerned with the draw. I'm... I'm quite on the fence with this one, but, you know, maybe it is the law each way. Well, I must have, I, I, I'm going with you on this one, actually. I, I think Tis the Law, following that break, um, after a busy time of it, 
early on. I, I, I think he's in his workouts recently been quite good. I think um, mm. I think he's primed to run a big race here. I, I think he'll turn the form over with Authentic um, from the Kentucky Derby. But you know, it, as Craig made a case for Authentic, it, it, it's going to be a cracking race no matter what. And as I said, we probably have mentioned the winner, but um, which horse that is is anyone's guess at the minute. Um, are there any other horses that are running uh, on the card, either of you two, either from Europe or America, that you're particularly looking forward to seeing? I'm quite uh, interested in um, look. Uh, she's a big price, but I'm quite interested in seeing Medaya. I think she ran really well um, back at Ascus, and she just she just blew up a bit, you know, in the final furlong. Obviously, you know, it's a tough race with. Magical SL running, but she's interesting at a big price, I think. She's in the turf, isn't she? Yeah, I just think she's quite a light framed sort of horse who'll deal with these conditions, and I think she could run well. That's, uh... I hope she stays in training next year as well, but you know, that's a different story. Um, yeah. That's Frankel there, a Frankel uh, horse. We have to mention him in every podcast. Craig, <laughs> particularly looking forward to um well i mean obviously the the races we've talked about are uh, top quality races so i'm looking forward to them but on the friday um i'm quite interested in the breeders cup juvenile which is the last race on the friday and i'm really excited to see jackie's warrior out again um very impressive last time in the champagne stakes made a mockery of our opponents um there and also a good win in the uh run happy hopeful stakes as well so a couple of grade one wins on the the trot uh she's unbeaten um and i think she'll go five for five which race is she in she's in the it's in the 10 15 it's the breeders cup juvenile the last one on the friday all right so it's the colts which what what was the name again? Uh, sorry, Jackie's Warrior. Yes. Um, Jackie Warrior. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Apologies. Yes, yeah, cold. <laughs> um, I always make that mistake. It's the time yeah. tired. <laughs> right, well, we'll um, out for that one. Um, yeah, Jackie's Warrior. Definitely, I think it'll be one to watch. Right, fantastic. Well, let's see how that one goes. Um, thank you, you two, as always. It's been a pleasure talking to you. And um, let's hope we enjoy the meeting. And never know, maybe Job Mom might be celebrating another Breeders' Cup winner. I hope so, anyway. Hopefully so. Yeah, fingers crossed. Right, thank you to Kitty and to Craig and thank you to everyone for listening to this. I don't think we'll be doing another one this year. We'll have to wait till next season now, but it's been a fun experiment and um, I definitely think it's something we'll be continuing with. Uh, we enjoy doing them. Hope you enjoy listening to them and um, see you soon, I guess. Bye-bye.